If the Bernie Sanders tax proposals under the For the 99.5% Act are enacted, there will be huge changes for grantor trusts. Now, we can assume that the change will apply to grantor trusts that are created on or after the date of enactment of the law and that certain grantor trusts will be grandfathered in, but it's important to also watch for retroactivity. For those grantor trusts that are not grandfathered, we'll have some significant changes, such as inclusion in the gross estate of the grantor at death, Terminating grantor trust status to avoid that outcome during life will be treated as a gift and an amount equal to the fair market value of the trust at the time, minus any previous gifts or consideration paid back to the grantor. Now, there is a trade-off in the form of a basis step-up for assets in a non-grandfathered grantor trust at death, but there will be special issues to take into account for certain types of trusts that are grantor trusts such as islets, slats, and grantor trusts that are set up to sell assets. I'm Griffin Bridgers and this is 10 Minutes with Griffin. For today's episode, episode 173, we're going to look at part two of an analysis of the For the 99.5% Act. We're going to look particularly at the effect on grantor trusts under this act. Now as always, this presentation is not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice and is provided for educational purposes only. And if you would like a copy of these slides, please email me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. Now, getting back to the act, which I uh, presented in yesterday's episode, episode 172, it seems a long shot for a lot of these proposals to be enacted, but it's important to consider what the effect might be on grantor trusts if this act is passed. Now, what does the act do to grantor trusts? Well, as it stands right now, if you retain certain powers over an irrevocable trust, it can be treated as a grantor trust for income tax purposes, which means the trust is disregarded for income tax purposes. But those powers might not rise to the level of causing the trust assets to be included in the gross estate of the grantor at death under code sections 2036 or 2038. What the act will do is close that loophole, if you can call it that, and will basically cause any retained interest in that causes a trust to be a grantor trust for income tax purposes to now be treated also as a retained interest for gift or estate tax purposes under a new code section 2901 that will be enacted. So this section will apply to anybody who's a deemed grantor, whether it's the grantor actually funding the trust or a beneficiary that's a deemed owner of the trust under code section 678. So under this new code section 2901, the following will be transfer tax events. One will be the death of the grantor. If there's a trust that the grantor created during life that's irrevocable, and the grantor dies while it is a grantor trust, then all of the assets of that trust will be included in the grantor's gross estate. Similarly, if there's a distribution during the grantor's life from a grantor trust, that distribution will be treated as a gift by the grantor. And then finally, if the grantor sees the tea leaves here and decides, hey, I don't like this effect, I want to terminate grantor trust status, then that event of terminating the grantor trust status will be treated as a gift by the grantor at the time. Now, there's a few layers to this. One, if you have a trust where the assets are already includable in the grantor's gross estate, this section won't apply. Two, we don't know the effective date, whether you'll have certain grantor trusts that are grandfathered in, and we can only hope that we have grandfathered grantor trusts when we look at this overall. Now, 
When we look to the gift tax provisions especially and the estate tax provisions to a certain amount, it's important to note that the gift tax amount will be net of one, consideration received by the grantor, and two, any prior gifts to the trust taken into account for gift tax purposes by the grantor. So really what this is going to capture is the appreciation and the value of the trust assets and the income of those trust assets that occurs after the gift. Now based on a plain reading of the, the statute, one thing we're unclear on will be the gift tax valuation for distributions because this code section speaks to the portion of the grantor trust to which this section applies, but it's hard to trace income and appreciation to an amount that was already subject to gift tax versus an amount that's um, considered as the post-gift appreciation and in income. So we'll have to look to that. And also there will be a question too in my mind on whether this imposes some sort of withholding or filing requirement on the trustee if a distribution is going to be subject to gift tax, much like we might see with the, uh, the taxable distribution regime under the generation skipping transfer tax. Now that being said, there are certain types of grantor trusts I see that are pretty common that are really going to be disproportionately affected by this. One will be irrevocable life insurance trusts, also known as islets. Now, it's important to note that most islets are grantor trusts in one or two ways. One is if income of the trust can be used to pay premiums on the life insurance, it is a grantor trust. And two, even if income can't be used to pay premiums, if you have a spouse as a beneficiary during the grantor's life, i.e. before the policy pays out, then if that spouse can receive distributions of income or principal by the trustee, it will be a grantor trust as well. We'll look at that a little bit more with the slat. But it's easy to solve the first, it's difficult to solve the second. And a lot of these issues will depend on whether or not you have grandfathered grantor trust here. But in the worst case, for islets that aren't grandfathered, uh, created after the new law, they'll need to probably be funded with income producing assets, maybe uh, tax exempt income like municipal bonds, which will not provide any lifetime distributions to the spouse and which won't cause any tax issues for the trust because that income will be, will be taxed at much higher brackets if it's a non-grantor trust. There could also be issues with crummy powers in the way those have traditionally been used here as well, even for grandfathered islets. But that's a discussion for a later episode. Now for slats, spousal lifetime access trusts, which use the grantor's gift tax exclusion, you know, they're typically grantor trusts, e even if they don't use the gift tax exclusion, because the spouse is a beneficiary. And because of that, it's difficult to make a non-grantor slat. I had a previous episode where I talked about this in greater detail, because any discretionary distribution of income or principal to a spouse makes the slat a grantor trust. Now, even though for a non-grandfathered slat, the distribution would be a gift, we could make the argument here that the distribution to the spouse would qualify for the gift tax marital deduction. But overall, this might be a bad play if this act comes into play. So with this, we might see lifetime Q-tip trust being a better option, but if you're gonna make a partial Q-tip election, then the non-Q-tip portion of the trust would still be a grantor trust with respect to the uh, trust creator, would still be included in the grantor's gross estate, uh, which is a bad outcome. This kind of cuts off the partial Q-tip election loophole we saw previously. And with a sale to a grantor trust, obviously there's an effect here. But the question is going to be the interpretation of consideration received by the grantor under the new code section 2901. So the question is whether that note payable back to the grantor would be treated as consideration that offsets the value of the deemed gift uh, that occurs at if the grantor trust status is terminated or if there's a distribution. Uh, and arguably at a state tax uh, level, 
the note would already be included in the uh, the gross estate. So uh, the question there too would be whether that could be subtracted from the value of the trust that's included in the gross estate, maybe under code section 2043. But at the very least, the effect on a non-grandfathered grantor trust is going to be that the appreciation of the assets above and beyond the down payment and the value of the note will be subject to either estate or gift tax. And consequentially generation skipping transfer tax as well. Now, you can subtract the gift tax value of the down payment at the very least and maybe the note and depending on the outcome here, we may have some things we need to look at for grant or trust that maybe are created before the act but might not be grandfathered for some reason uh, or could be disproportionately affected. Things like maybe paying off the note early in kind, forgiving the note to use up the 11.7 million exclusion and or terminating grant or trust status for a trust that might not ultimately be grandfathered in. So when we look at the overall cost to grantor trust here, I've covered this in great detail where you compare the effect of the, uh, the income tax benefit. And one thing that's left up to interpretation here is whether the actual payment of income tax on behalf of the grantor trust would also be treated as a gift to the beneficiaries because it's not right now. We have no idea if that'll be the case because that's left silent in the act, but there will be gross estate inclusion at potentially a higher estate tax rate, 45, 50, 55, or even 65%. But the trade-off is we do get a step up in basis for grantor trust assets for non-grandfathered trusts, and that'll offset that effective tax rate, but not by as much. Now, there could be capital gain reform that raises that rate as well, which could maybe even the scales a little bit there. And it's also important to note, too, that one, we need to take into account that step up in basis and net that out. And also keep in mind that we there there's no change in the Act to Code Sections 2001b2 and 2001g, which allow you to use your $11.7 million exemption right now, maybe even for a non-grandfathered uh, grantor trust, and apply that as applicable credit against the estate tax. And you may benefit from that higher rate when you compute that applicable credit as well. So you might get uh, a proportional benefit there, um, depending on what the rate play ends up being with grantor trusts. As always, if you have questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of 10 Minutes with Griffin, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.